Geshe Wonga was a wonderful mentor. He was a wonderful model. He had a Geshe degree and he was very learned and so forth. So he had, he, he had taught in Columbia University actually, but language. He taught the language there uh, in the Middle Eastern department before I knew him. And um, so he did, and he had a lot of private students and personal students like me, eventually became his student. And he was a total earthquake for me. But his thing was, he was not really seeking to create an empire of Dharma centers. He really was there to benefit those who sought his help. Whether, and that, he didn't think that everyone should be Buddhist either. He would tell people, go back to your, go see your rabbi. You know, he would tell somebody, go back and help your mother. He didn't want to recruit people into being monks or nuns. He did not. Unless, I mean, he would not oppose it if it could be helpful to them. In my case, he knew I was sincerely wanted to be a monk, but he knew that I would not have the support. And I had to, didn't have the kind of destiny to do that because he was clairvoyant for sure. I know for a fact he was clairvoyant. Not by that I'm clairvoyant and know that, but by the way he intervened in different situations in my life, knowing exactly what was going on in my head. And uh, he was a great person. And he, he was there. I actually said it all in the very first meeting I had with him when I was leaving, having been sent off by him to go back and take up a job in India with Tibetan refugees there and having a ticket in hand, but telling my friend who had driven me there to his little monastery in New Jersey, I'm coming back, I'm studying with this guy, I'm not going back to India until I've had a chance to study with him. This was my teacher. And the guy said, well, why? Why is that? You have a ticket to go back, Dalai Lama, Tibetan Lamas in India, blah, blah, blah. How come you're not doing that? Well, just, we met this guy, he gave us a piece of pie, we talked to him. He needs some English teachers for his young monks? Why? And I said, no, on a spiritual level, he is my teacher. And then why? And I said, because he's not there himself. And what I meant by that, and I didn't, it just blurted it out, you know, and I didn't at the time, I think, really know what it meant, and maybe I still don't, but I have a little better sense of it than I did then. And what it means is that, you know, I had been in a lot of religious things, Christian, Sufi, Hindu, and uh, not so many Buddhist uh, ones it's in, in Asia, but, but yet, because I was just getting started with them in India. But I'd been in a lot of places, and there are these holy gurus who are luminous sometimes. But then you feel you're a little nothing next to them and they're all there about themselves and how do you fit into their agenda is what you feel. And I was always suspicious of that. I wasn't wanting to do a role as a follower and a devotee and, a, and I don't even want to be religious. I still am not that religious in what normal people normally think of as religious. They follow blindly and just think somebody else is going to solve my problem. I, I'm not. <clears throat> and... Uh, I sensed that he didn't have an agenda for me other than the one he articulated, which was that he was seeking an English teacher for his young lamas who had been sent to, to his little lamas area there in New Jersey in order to do, among other things, study more of their own safe studies, but also learn English so the Dalai Lama could have them as interpreting monks. This was in the early 60s, you know, 62, you know. So I just knew that he was the kind of, and that, that's the nature of a Buddha. A Buddha doesn't manifest even a body in Buddhist theory, except to benefit beings who need to interact with that kind of body, who can't find the sort of subtle body, Obi-Wan Kenobi sort of Buddha, who would just sort of, you know, like send, be a rainbow in front of them or something like that. They need a person who's going to tell them, like, don't put your soy sauce, don't pig up the soy sauce begin to like chip away at their identity and self-indulgence and all this, you know, identity habit and self-preoccupation and self-cherishing habit. You know, someone who does that personally, that's really a needed thing, a great teacher like that. He was that kind of great teacher. And he therefore, he didn't, he was centrifugal as a teacher. People would come and he would serve them as best he could and he would want them to get back into what he felt they really needed to do in life, their job or their family or whatever it was. You know, and um, and um, be part of their community, with, which would might mean staying Christian, being Jewish, being being Muslim. Not so many Muslim people visited him, but those who did, whoever it was, he or being secular. And he was like his holiness. He was like that.
So his significance is, I think, great in this, that sense still. And um, he's a kind of emanation, you could say, of the great Kavalokiteshvara, like his holiness.